Yes. So, uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for this initiative, and uh, it's been uh, very interesting so far, and I look forward to uh, hearing the rest of this conference. And um, like Robert Merrily has mentioned, I hope we can all meet in Cyprus in the not too distant future. Right, um, I shall talk about the um, media coverage or press coverage, really, of the Swedish Cyprus expedition. But uh, Thomas also asked me to say a few words on um, Swedish archaeology abroad in the 1920s and 30s in general, so we can set this uh, expedition in, uh, in context, as it were. So I, I shall begin by, by giving you uh, an outline of, of some Swedish well, uh, archaeological endeavors abroad, and then um, we will zoom in on the uh, Cyprus expedition. And I hope I will be able to show you something new, because you may think, well, what else is there to add from the Swedish Cyprus expedition? Well, I hope to be able to show you something new, at least, uh, at least how the expedition was received in Sweden. And um, so, well, you, one can't really talk about this um, enterprise without mentioning a key figure, and that is the um, then Crown Prince of Sweden, Gustav Adolf. And he, as we, I hope to be able to show you, played a very important role in not just the Cyprus expedition, but also in the other Swedish archaeological um, excavations abroad. But if we start with the with the beginning, in a way, with the with the prehistory, you, you you may say, because I will really restrict myself to the 20s and 30s. But it really starts um, uh, in 1894 with the Swedish excavations at uh, Calabria uh, in Poros, the island of Poros in Greece. And this is the first Swedish excavation in Greece. And uh, what they excavated in that year, in that summer, 1894, was the um, sanctuary of Poseidon. Or, and uh, the archaeologists were Sam Wiede and Lennart Schellberg. And this is a uh, a long time before Sweden had its own institute at Athens, so the the permit was organized thanks uh, to the German archaeologists, and uh, you can see Wilhelm Dirkfeld here uh, on the right visiting the site during the excavation. So that was just for that one year, and I, I can just add as a curiosity that uh, Calabria later on became a very big project for the Swedish Institute at Athens, and um, still being investigated by the Institute, as you can see from the image on, on the left. One of these archaeologists, Lena Schellberg, then moved on to working in the, in the Ottoman Empire at Larissa in Aeolis in 1902, together with the, the uh, um, German archaeologist Johannes Berlau. And they found buildings and architectural terracottas, and the selection of these finds were brought to Sweden. And you can see one of those terracottas here, uh, presently at the Middelhavs Museum. And there was a royal patronage for this excavation as well. It was uh, from the um, a king at the time, Oscar II, so the grandfather of the crown prince, Gustav Adolf, whom we shall return to. And if we then start looking really at the 1920s, uh, there is a strong focus on Greece, and we have uh, Axel W. Persson working at Assini, Dendra, and um, Midea. And the uh, excavations at Assini began in 1922. They went on, on and off, you may say, until 1930. The Crown Prince had himself visited the site in 1920, and he impressed by the potential of it, encouraged Persson to excavate the site. And uh, so they began in 1922, and um, His Royal Highness came and visited the site and uh, participated in the excavations for seven weeks in 1922. And he was not just an amateur interested in archaeology, he had actually studied archaeology at Uppsala University and excavated also in Sweden and would go on throughout his very long life. He lived to, to 
to, to in his into his early nineties and um, uh, excavated uh, throughout his whole life. And uh, this project was funded through the Assini committee, uh, chaired by the crown prince himself. And this committee raised the money, and they were able to pay for both the excavations and the publication. This would be a model that they would use for several other field projects, especially in the Mediterranean. And here we have some, uh, I think these are really interesting, fantastic images. To the left, you see the crown prince himself active at, at the Civ. And here is a contemporary, well, cartoon really, drawing of, of him. Note the crown on, on the Civ here. So, yeah, and, on, and there is Axel W. Person himself, the director of the excavations. They excavated other sites in the Argolid. Uh, we have Dendra in 1926 and then Medea in 1939, um, mainly prehistoric uh, sites. Uh, there was a strong focus on not just Greece, but also on, on prehistory. There is the Swedish Messenia expedition in 1927 to 1936 by Nathan Valmin. And Valmin came to Messenia after Asini just like Yerstad came to Cyprus after Asini. So the Asini excavation was really the start for, for, for many of these archaeologists who would then go on to really influence Swedish archaeology, classical archaeology. Another site one could mention here is Berbati in the Argolid and also Asea in Arcadia. Um, Berbati excavated by Persson, Sävlund and Holmberg, a prehistoric settlement. Asea by Holmberg was excavated, uh, uh, was an Acropolis. Um, the excavation was on the Acropolis of Asea, and they found prehistoric finds as well as an archaic Doric temple. And as with, was the case with Asini, Swedish archaeologists returned to these sites again and again over the years, and uh, projects are in some cases still active. At the same time, um, the Swedish Institute of Classical Studies in Rome was founded, and this also was the, an initiative of the Crown Prince. He had called a meeting in the Royal Palace in Stockholm in 1925, and it was decided to found the Swedish Institute in Rome, not Athens. And the Crown Prince was in favor of Athens, but uh, they, they decided that Rome would be a good base also for going to Greece. So in 1926, the Institute began its activities in Rome under the um, first director, Axel Boetius. And the Crown Prince was chairman of the board, not just a sort of symbolic figurehead. He was an active chairman and he stayed on the board in this role until he became king in 1950. And in Italy, uh, Boetius began the excavations at Ardea. And later on, Gerstad would be digging on the, on the Roman Forum and on Orumbuarium and other sites in Rome, in Rome itself. But let's let's broaden the horizons a little here. And um, they were not just working in the Mediterranean. Uh, we have uh, this figure, Johan Gunnar Andersson, also known as China Gunnar in Sweden. Um, he was a geologist. He traveled with the Northern Schuld on the Swedish Antarctic expedition, and then he got an employment in China from 1914 as a geologist, and that led him onto paleontological and archaeological excavations. And he discovered the Neolithic Yangshao culture in the Henan province and played a part in the discovery of the Peking man. So he is uh, very, very well regarded in China and considered a key figure in Chinese archaeology. He was professor of Far Eastern archaeology at the University of Stockholm and also founder of the Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities in Stockholm, where many of these finds ended up. As you can see here, just from one of the showcases, what's on display in, in that museum from the Yangshao culture. Anderson's work in China was uh, closely followed and supported by the Crown Prince. And again, the Crown Prince was chairman of the China Committee can see here on this painting, the crown prince seated on the right. He also undertook a trip in 1926 to 1927. And uh, whilst visiting Korea, he was participating in an excavation here, as you can see on the picture on the left. 
he also purchased a lot of Chinese objects for his collection, and uh, many of these were later um, um, donated to the um, Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities. If we move to Iran, there is the Swedish archaeological expedition to Iran in the early 30s, directed by Ture Arne. And he himself had a very strong interest in Eastern influence on early periods in Scandinavian history. And um, this particular site they excavated, named Shakete, uh, had as its aims really at, uh, at uh, tracing contacts between China and Western Asia. This was uh, what they hoped to, to find. And even if they couldn't perhaps um, demonstrate this, the finds were important in their own right. And uh, above all, it's Bronze Age, and, but also an Islamic period settlement on, on this hill. And the Swedish share of those finds are now kept in the middle of museums. And on the next slide, you can see just a, an image from an excavation and a find and the publication. I'm moving very quickly through this, but it's just to give you an idea. Egypt, the Swedish excavations at Merim de Abu Ghalib uh, were also very important, and uh, not least for the, the, uh, the fact that the finds, or a large portion of the finds, ended up in the newly founded Egyptian Museum in Stockholm. It was founded in 1928, and the director of that museum, Swedish Egyptologist Per Lund, directed this excavation, which was a um, sort of a spin-off from the um, excavation undertaken by German archaeologist uh, Hermann Juncker at uh, Merim de Beni Salam. And the Crown Prince, again, you'll be surprised or not to hear, was chairman of the Egyptian committee. And um, that committee lay behind the foundation of the museum in Stockholm. Now to Cyprus, which you've all been waiting for, but this is really to set the scene and why this country, Sweden, in the northern periphery of Europe was able to have this large excavation in, in, on the island of Cyprus uh, is perhaps surprising, but if you see it in this context, uh, there were many other projects going, and as I said, the key figure in all of this is the crown prince himself. And I will now show you some examples of how the expedition was covered in Swedish media in the 1920s and 30s. Um, first of all, how it all started with the, um, with the um, um, sort of preparations for the expedition. There was this article in Dagens Nyheter, one of the two major newspapers in Sweden, uh, which says Swedish archaeologist travels to Cyprus for excavations. Archaeological expedition in preparation for the autumn, supported by committee, Crown Prince Chairman. That's what the headlines say here. And it's Aina Yastad, of course, on the picture. So this is from 1927, before they set off. And during the expedition, Aina Yastad himself wrote in that newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, many reports of the life and the days, and well, ages and days is what he calls uh, this book, that later collected these articles. And, um, and uh, it was published in Swedish in 1933, and then only in 1980 in English. So that's an important account, but that's Yastar's uh, account. He also wrote in the Illustrated London News, as you can see here, 1929 and 1932. And there is this important newsreel for Swedish cinemas by Svensk Film Industry, filmed by the architect and photographer of the expedition, Jon Lindros, that you can see here. And in 1930, the Crown Prince came to Cyprus and he took part in the excavations at Stili, near from Augusta, as we heard. And he was he played a key role again in the discussions, in the negotiations with the British governor, Sir Ronald Storrs. And um, Yastad himself writes like this, uh, that the Crown Prince succeeded in interesting the local British authorities in effecting a division of the expedition's finds, whereby the claims of Cyprus and Sweden but chiefly those of science were simultaneously satisfied. And as you know, a large proportion of the finds came to Sweden. Here they are, the 771 uh, cases in the port of Famagusta awaiting transportation to Stockholm. And this is what they came to. This is what Stockholm looks like today, I can tell you. We've had a lot of snow. 
and the uh, finds were stored in uh, facilities like this. And it was not heated unless they had these um, stoves next to the finds, not ideal, far from it. Far from it. And this is what, a, more, a few more images, Eric Schoekvist climbing on, on some steps here. I should like to thank my uh, former colleague at the Middelhavs Museet, uh, Fredrik Helander, for helping me finding these uh, paper clippings from the Cyprus Expedition's own archive. Um, and the Swedish media was very critical. Uh, they, they say um, this, um, this poor housing is unworthy of this amazing collection. This is just uh, um, a few examples. Provincial museums in Turkey were much better, says one foreign archaeologist who was shocked. And that's Hetty Goldman, who came in 1939 to study, but she gave up because of the conditions in the storerooms in Stockholm. One newspaper says, why bring all this material to Sweden if we can't house it properly? And Alfred Westholm of the expedition says that the museum in Nicosia has been modernized and the finds are excellently exhibited there. And as for the situation at home in Stockholm, he says, it's embarrassing. There were some uh, things going well, though. Um, the expedition mounted um, this lovely exhibition in 1933, which was praised by the press. Beautiful ex exhibition of the Cyprus treasures. Go there, enjoy and be amazed. Also, this exhibition in 1941 to 42 was praised by, by the media, also used for some fashion uh, um, um, photographs. Um, but um, to round off, as long as the expedition was in the field in Cyprus, reports mostly by Yastad were positive and enthusiastic. And the film really contributed to making the work known in Sweden. And there was a lot of national pride in this, we have to say. After the arrival in Stockholm, um, leading Swedish media were very critical of the neglect shown in the Cyprus collections. The, the expedition, the, sorry, the exhibitions were praised, but this critique that had been building up through the throughout the 1930s led to uh, the installation of a, of a permanent uh, small gallery of these uh, finds in the Museum of, of uh, His History in Stockholm. Um, in the 1940s, but it took until 1982 for the Cyprus collections to find a permanent, or so we hope, home in the Medelhavs Museet in Stockholm. And this is the museum that many of you have, have seen when you have visited Stockholm. And here is just the final slide to show you the, the current uh, uh, exhibition of the Cyprus collections. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much.